percentage of GDP between 2014 and 2016 July has been fluctuating between the 60% and 73%. As of July 2016, the debt to GDP ratio stood at 65.9%. This phenomenon is largely attributed to the lack of fiscal discipline where government's expenditure has consistently exceeded its revenue. Question. How will your administration, Dr. Nasigri Mahama, achieve fiscal discipline by reducing the debt burden and raising enough funds to grow the economy? As I said at the beginning, um, part of the problem is the fact that we are, as a nation, very inefficient. And I've said in my introduction that the way to actually mobilize revenue is to reduce taxes and spread the tax net. The physical indiscipline you talked about, where government is spending more than is bringing in, certainly leads to government borrowing domestically from the Bank of Ghana, which leads to inflation, and externally, which also leads to the weakening of the city. So we will balance the budget from day one by making sure that we match income with expenditure. When you match income with expenditure and you are not spending more than you are making, then you have physical discipline. If anything at all, we will go budget deficit of 3%, percent, not more, not more. Under those conditions, inflation will come down, interest rates will come down. When interest rates are down, business people and manufacturers will borrow money they will begin to increase their productivity in that process they employ more people the more people that are employed the more your income because you be, they were paying income tax so basically the physical in, in this indiscipline uh, is the uh, root cause of ghana's problems the government borrowing more than it is uh, earning another area uh, that we, 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 we will look at, of course, is making sure that um, we, we, we cut the interest rates. When the interest rates are high, people are unable to borrow for productive purposes except buy and sell. So Ghana has become a country where we are not producing, we are into buying and selling. Now, when you are buying, you are uh, making, uh, providing other countries where these products are made jobs for their people meanwhile your people don't have jobs so the physical discipline balanced budget uh, matching expenditure to income reducing the tax rates uh, widening the tax net is the way to go in order to to balance the the, the budget and to uh, make the economy economy grow we've already indicated that on agri alone we can increase the economy or grow the economy at 10 percent per annum now our greek is seasonal and in the case of for example rice growing we have promised that in two to three farming seasons we can reduce the rice import bill by 50 percent which means we'll put 500 million dollars in ghanaian rice growers pockets this is the way we go please continue ignore the time you've been given a minute extra it goes for all of you. Well, we, on the, back, on the back of agriculture, as I've already said, the one other thing that we'll do is cottage industry. Because with cottage industry, you can get a lot of the young people involved. The last political activity I did before I was wrongfully disqualified was to visit a young 25-year-old Ghanaian female graduate of the University of Ghana who has gone into farming and I was interested and intrigued by her because at 27 years of age I did rice farming to send myself to America from the proceeds of my rice farming so this young lady she's having support from Danida why can't our government do the same thing and get these young people into farming and um, uh, she's actually rearing pigs and processing the pork 
for supply to um, some of the hotels. So that is the way to go, and uh, that's what PNC administration will do. Thank you, Dr. Edward Mahama. We would come up with a follow-up question that will be asked by a member of the audience, and it will go for all of you. Shall we hear Dr. Papakwesi Indum? How will your administration achieve fiscal discipline by reducing the debt bedding and raising enough funds to grow the economy? When, when you, ha you get to be in this position, the position we're in, which is near hippic uh, situation, it means that you have borrowed way too much money than you can handle it indeed. Uh, the payments that we're making uh, actually exceed even our normal regular income as a nation. So we are in dangerous times. And when you are in dangerous time, any business person, proper business person will tell you that it is time to become lean, which is why I emphasize that an administration led by me will, will be lean. No more than 40 ministers of state, that is everybody included, deputy ministers and so on and so forth, not more than 40, will rely on the use of public servants. Number two, we need to stop and we will stop the use of state funds to fund a campaign for the party in power. If you recall, that is what happened in 2012, and we haven't recovered. And it is going on now, and which means that I become president, John Dramani Mahama leaves me with a huge problem that I need to come and resolve. So we'll spend less, we'll spend less. And number two, we, we, this matter of national identification system, which will bring discipline into our economy, we will implement it aggressively because that is what will assist us with a, with a unique number for everybody to know who is buying a house, who is selling a house, who is renting a property, who is doing what in this country so that we can bring discipline and collect the taxes that we need all over the country. And we will stop the showcase projects. When we can't, we don't have roads leading to our farms, you build fancy flyovers. Who is going to produce? to pay for the fancy flyovers. So we will make sure that we spend more to generate, to generate revenue. So as far as reducing the debt is concerned, it's a simple formula. Number one, a lead administration. Number two, resists the use of state funding, state money to fund political campaigns. Number three, ensure that we, we bring discipline by implementing aggressively the national identification system and number four ensure that we don't borrow to fund showcase project and we aggressively in, in, invest and support our local industries so that they can produce more they can employ more and therefore pay more taxes um, and as they pay tax if more people are paying tax we can afford to reduce the level of taxation so that people will pay tax um, on a regular basis and so when it comes to this matter of debt thing that some people uh, are saying or, or are, are denying, look, we are a nation bogged down by debt. And, and so we must cut the size of our cloth, uh, what we wear, uh, according to uh, the, the, the provisions of what we have in terms of revenue. And, and let me say very clearly to everybody that corruption Corruption is one thing that has put us into debt. Because it's not as if we don't have money in this country. But some people have been wasting our money. Some people have been dashing our monies left and right to people who don't deserve to have them. And if we put all of our monies on the right table, we will find that indeed we have enough money to spend. We can pay down debt. We can fund our productive enterprises. And Ghana will be a much more prosperous nation for all of us. You still have a minute. You still have a minute extra for you. For, for, that, for, that, for that extra um, time, what I wish to say is that you cannot run an administration in the 21st century without technology. Without technology. And so today, everybody still runs to the Ministry of Finance. And so many people have budgets approved, but they can't spend. 
they all run into the one center, which is one part of where corruption happens, which is also a reason why we have inefficiency in government. So an important element is the use of technology in government to ensure that all that we do, all that we do becomes clear, becomes transparent, that everybody knows what is it that we're doing, and, and that uh, as we, we look at any private sector organization in Ghana today, they are using 21st century technology and they are efficient. We will do the same uh, in government. Shall we hear from Mr. Jacob Osayewa? Um, thank you very much. First and foremost, we need to understand the root cause of these deficits. First, we are practicing a very expensive democracy. And because of political economy, winners would have to find a means of repaying these amounts spent. So when you see the big billboards and all the spent nature, then you should understand that each one of us, and as a nation, we need to find a means of paying that. This was actually exacerbated by the single spine salary structure that the nation embarked on. You know, well, from, from theory, you could see that when you just increase wages without necessarily reducing employment, you actually shake up the GDP. And for that matter, it takes a natural course, that jigsaw, for the curve to fit into. And that is why, as a nation, we are all experiencing this. And how can we go um, in, re in resolving this? First, it's what I earlier on stated. We need to create worth as a nation. There's the need for us to accelerate the rate at which we can create industry out of all our natural resources. Second, because of this root cause of political economy, whether we like it or not, the politicians, most of them have come out to say that by all means, they have to pay where they got that sources of money to. How can we close that? And that is why we are opting for the fact that we are not only going to allow the auditors general doing the post auditing, but rather we're going to inculcate what we call the pre auditing. Before any expenses is taken by any MDA, the auditors general would have to okay that before that expenditure go. And that we think that will help bring in um, the physical uh, discipline that we're talking about. We also need the visibility of our governors. Okay, normally most of the analysis that we make is, we normally make is just more or less guessing. And that is why we say that we need to establish the national electronic data infrastructure that um, tracks the life cycle of each individual together with the properties and so on and so forth. By so doing, we'll be able to help expand the task net Okay, if you are able to expand the task net to include the, the informal uh, sectors and the traditional sectors, then we'll be in a position for the government to have, um, to have money. Thank you very much. Uh, we shall now go to the audience to take a question, which is a follow-up on the question of the economy to all of you, starting with Dr. Edward Mahama and Dr. Jemima Nunu, Head of Center for Management Development, Business School of Gimpa, has that question for you. Okay, I can't immediately spot her. So what I do is we will proceed. Now, when Dr. Mahama, you speak about, and you have one minute, when you speak about the plans that you have to match income with expenditure and to ensure that there is interest rates are lowered as a means of ensuring reducing the debt burden and raising uh, sufficient enough funds to grow the economy, can you state two specific 
steps, including, for example, legislation for that purpose, if it is necessary for your uh, proposition. For the plan you have to reduce the debt burden yes. and to raise sufficient funding to yeah. grow the economy, yeah. can you state two specific steps that you will take, including legislation, if that will be required? Yes. Two specific steps that one can take is one, to make sure or uh, if it is through legislation that the ministers are not taking their salaries through the budget of the ministry. I asked an accountant, can you tell me, from the controller and accountant general, can you tell me how much it really cost to run the government, ministers, deputy ministers? And he couldn't because he said the ministers have some other benefits that come from their ministry's budget. So basically, it means that we are running a bloated government because of the fact that we have not fixed. You know it. Ministers take petrol, coupons for petrol. They live in houses that uh, they, do, they don't pay the rent. So the important thing to do is to make sure that every minister is given a certain amount of money and he can go and rent his own place and he can buy his own uh, petrol. It is not proper for us to have to pay phone bills for ministers or pay their uh, uh, petrol uh, expenses. Um, these are the areas, you know, rent and so on, that we are overspending because these are necessary things. And if they are coming from the ministry's budget rather than paid directly to the minister so that he can manage his own salary, just like anybody else, that will control it. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Papakwesi Indum, you talk about a lean government of not more than maximum 40 ministers, among others also taking away showcase projects, as you call them. How have you assessed the need for a fiscal discipline legislation? Is it necessary to achieve what you seek? Well, um, in what I am looking to do, uh, it's not a matter of legislation. It's a matter of discipline. It's a matter of competence. It's a matter of the leader of the nation knowing what to do. That is why I'm saying, first of all, to have the courage, the experience to know that 40 ministers of state is all that we need. I've been a minister for public sector reform before, and I do know that if we implement performance evaluation if we ensure that the right things are done by the public servants and give them security of tenure, we can get a lot done through the public service and, and stop the interference of the politicians. I am against professional politicians, and I want to make sure that we take them out of the system and bring competence, experience to run the administration. That will be there from year to year. So it's not a matter of legislation. It's a matter of leadership. It is a matter of knowing what is it that you should do. And let me, let me bring in the element of what everybody now calls single spine. Single spine didn't just come to be on its own. It was part of a comprehensive pay reform system. And one was, yes, to, to, to equalize and make sure that you get equal pay for work of equal value. But there were some other components. There was a phase one, phase two, phase three. And at the end of phase four, we were going to eliminate the need to give cars and petrol and water and so on and so forth for government officials. That hasn't happened. And so people spend whatever it is that they want. We need to go back to it, implement it well. The other element of this pay reform was also productivity increment. And that has not happened. I know what it is supposed to be done. I will make sure it gets done. That's why part of my program is an accelerated public sector reform program led by a competent person. Thank you, Dr. Indum. Now, Mr. Jacob Oseyebwa, you talk about creating industries out of all natural resources. What exactly do you mean by that? 
First, let's take the gold industry. Now we're talking about picking up gold and developing the value chain, right from the mining, the refinery, the jewelry industries, and then the markets. And then going to the stands and looking for the international market where we can enter into an agreement for those who develop the circuit boards. We use a lot of gold in them. And then we can also come at Ghana coming from the background of Coke, uh, Gold Coast. We can rebrand our gold and how we can explore the markets. Let's take, for instance, for, for the manganese industry. And that is what, you know, manganese is a very hard metal. And that is what we use in the Amori industry. We can add value to it and especially make sure that we don't actually export them in raw material, but we can develop the industry that can convert them into the sheets. And we can even go to the extent of um, having um, assembly plans for armor cars and so on and so forth. You can pick about cassava. We have the, the, the sun, which is also a natural resource where we are enjoying maximum of it. We can develop the solar energy system more into it. We're talking about the wind. We have the salt. The salt which is in the sea is part of the natural resources. We can create industry. Most of the oil uh, industries around the globe are looking for salt. And for that matter, once we are bordered with the Atlantic, we can develop the salt industries, look for markets, and then make sure we each and every single natural resource that we have. By so doing, we'll be creating wealth. That is the solution that we need as a people. And that is what can actually solve most of the problems that we have and solve the high level of unemployment of our youth. Thank you. And your next major questioning, and this time around, Dr. Papakosi Indum, interest rates in Ghana now stand at about 33%. Obviously, uh, this is very high and limits the capacity of businesses to borrow to expand and further stifles entrepreneurship. Japan is charging 0% interest. In the UK, interest rates are around 1.5%. What will you do as president to address the issue of high interest rates and improve access to finance for small and medium scale enterprises? Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful question because there, there's some relatively simple answers that many people have you know, passed by. I mentioned earlier on the pension law. I was part of the people who, who came up with the idea that we need to reform our pension system. But we said we, we need to tie it to long-term savings so that we can, be, we can provide long-term capital for, the, for our industries. Well, it was going on course until it went to parliament and some people decided that Oh, the private sector people, we give them our long-term pension money, they, must, they can misuse it, and therefore, let's constrain them. And let's come up with this provision that the majority of those funds have to be, have to be used to invest in, in state bonds such as treasury bills. And so we've gone backwards. We've collected long-term funds, and we are giving it back to the government through treasury bills. And as the last time I checked, we have got a little over 4 billion uh, Ghana cities, and it is growing by leaps and bounds. And so, very simply, we will want to change the legislation uh, to take it back to the original intention so that those long-term funds channeled through private sector fund manage ma managers can now go to fund our dreams as entrepreneurs, men and women, all over the country. And, and that is where you get the competition competition, good competition to the banks. And, and it doesn't make any sense that I want to come up with a project with a life cycle of 10 years and I have to go to a, a universal or commercial bank uh, who is thinking short term, you know, 16 months, 18 months, 24 months. It doesn't make any sense. There is a solution there. We will aggressively explore that solution so that the long-term funds can indeed be on the table. And if we're going to regulate, the, reg the way to regulate is to look at the performance of the people uh, in the pension industry to ensure that indeed they are not spending the funds on frivolous projects, uh, on projects that are not feasible 
and so on and so forth. So for me to talk about not lending or government uh, or crowding out the private sector and so on and so forth, it's easy to say. But there is a solution that everybody has been ignoring and it is there in the pension law. And, and, and I'll tell you why we came up with that. You go back to the US, they have something called the 401k plan that they came up with. That 401k plan has helped many, 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 many people boosted their stock market and so on and so forth. We must do the same in Ghana and we'll get the right results. Thank you very much, Dr. Indum. Now, Mr. Jacob Osei, well, same question to you. And since you are talking about creating industries out of all the natural resources, how are you going to deal with high interest rates and ensure to improve access to finance for small scale, small and medium scale enterprises? Uh, thank you. First and foremost, you see, interest rates had to do with risk from finance point of view. The higher your risk, the higher your interest rates. And that is why we say that we need to give visibility because the banks are complaining that those who normally come in for loan, they find it very difficult to track them. And at this point in time, they have debts over six billion. And for that matter, that is why we say that initially we'll introduce the National Electronic Data Infrastructure, which has a, a whole lot of, of visibility to give out, out to the banks and then the byproduct, which is the National ID card. We have to remove the risk, and by so doing, we'll be able to deal with a high level of interest rate. And now, as a, as a young entrepreneur, what I've experienced in this country from our banks, I think it's not helpful. And for that matter, as part of our manifesto, what we have stated is that we are going to introduce uh, what we call the entrepreneurial bank. Okay? With that entrepreneurial bank, we're going to have experts in the various businesses. And so when, 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 um, when a young man has an idea, the person will just present the idea to the bank. The bank will go through the idea, both and develop a business plan. The bank will have an equity in that business that both are developing. And as the profits are generated, at a point in time, the bank can start with 80% equity and will constantly reducing it so that the young man will be able to build the business out of that. Basudin will be uh, doing this. And at, at the same time, we have to make sure that we set, you see, we need to take deliberate policy. A policy to say that this is what we want to do. And so making certain funds available that can help these small to medium enterprises to have easy access to, and it's not as usual um, with the government, free freebies coming from government. But we have to make sure that we have a meticulous way of uh, recouping whatever that we've actually given out to these young entrepreneurs. And by so doing, we'll be able to make a lot of funds available. We should understand that this the, the interest rates and all the microeconomic indices, they are just the symptoms. But the root cause, as I keep on saying, is about creating wealth. When our mindsets are is about creating wealth, it's going to help us and bring this spirit of entrepreneurship in our young ones. So that at the end of the day, once wealth are created because of demand and supply jigsaw, by all means, interest rates will come down and the banks will be forced to come down. Here we are in a country where the government itself is borrowing at, at a rate of 22%. So definitely it's going to affect all of us. Thank you. Now, Dr. Edward Mahawa, the same question to you. Yes, the um, problem with the interest rates, in my view, is one, lack of productivity. We're not very productive as a nation. Two, government borrowing too much and crowding the small guy out of, out of it. And government is borrowing too much because government is spending more than it is actually making. There are other areas that government can, can actually rake in revenue. For example, if our streets were properly labeled, named, and the houses numbered, real estate taxes could be a source of income. We know that most uh, homeowners are not paying any real estate taxes, yet the government wants some money. As I said, productivity is an area that is very, very low. We don't demand productivity from even the public servants. 
In 2004, when I was running, I told Professor Adam of the University of Science and Technology, let's put a punch clock in every government ministry, and everybody will punch to go to work. Because they come to work, maybe spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour in the office, and then they leave. So productivity is an area where we really need to look at. And government must take the lead in making sure that government employees are productive. And as I said, even the informal sector, bringing them in, you know, will be able to raise revenue there. I've already made that point. And cut down corruption. Corruption is something I've said is, is, is if we can reduce corruption by 30 to 40 percent, we'll get all the money we need and we won't have to go to IMF and the World Bank. Go to the ports and see what happens when goods arrive. These uh, importers, customs officers, they make deals and the money goes into private pockets. So government is losing a lot of money through this uh, corruption and uh, I will make sure as president that I go after those areas, seal those holes where the government revenue is leaking and br bring it in so that we can develop the country. Thank you. You have a bit more time, but uh, if that's where you want to conclude. Then you take the, the next substantive question. Right. Yes. If, you know, if we're talking about the high interest rates, and I've already indicated that because government itself is borrowing the money, it's crowding out the uh, entrepreneurs and people who want to um, uh, do businesses. I know as a matter of fact that some small scale businesses that are manufacturing cannot go and borrow at 33 percent and make profit only those who are buying and selling may be able to make that kind of profit so thank you your time is up now we will be taking a question for all of you from mr kojo Kwesing, who is a Kra regional manager of the agi but whilst he gets ready to do that uh, let's turn our attention to employment because the things you talk about will directly impact on employment and how will you deliberately create employment. The World Bank's recent landscape of jobs in Ghana report indicates that 48% of Ghanaian youth between 15 and 24 years are unemployed. There is also an expected annual average of 200,000 unemployed graduates churned out by the numerous tertiary institutions nationwide. Should you be elected come December 7, please state and explain, state and explain the three top most actions you will take to significantly address the high rate of youth unemployment and reduce it to the barest minimum. Thank you. Um, I've already referred to this young lady, 25-year-old graduate from Legon, who is into farming. And I gave myself as an example, at 27 years old, a doctor already, but I had to go to farming to, inc to, 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 to save money to educate myself abroad. So agri is one area where we think that we can rapidly for example, if we are growing the rice, which I intend to lead Ghanaian farmers to grow, that rice has to be harvested, polished, bagged, and shipped, and even labeled. So basically, these are all jobs that you create, the value-added uh, uh, value jobs that you, you, cre you create. Whether you are doing starch, or you are doing uh, um, um, uh, cornmeal, um, these are all value, uh, these are areas where you can actually create jobs. I've said, for example, that a farm plains is a very fertile land that will help maize farmers to grow a lot of maize and then will set up poultry feed factories to turn the maize into poultry feed. Then that poultry is fed to our children. That is why I'm promising every Ghanaian school child that they will have a drumstick at lunch because we will grow the maize, we'll grow the poultry, and we'll feed it to them. You see, we have come a food cycle. And along the lines, even the chicken has to be dressed. You know, the feathers have to be taken. All these are jobs. They have to be cut. 
you know, into pieces and sold or served. All these are jobs. So with the agric alone, we are emphasizing that in two to three farming seasons, we will reduce the unemployment rate by 50 percent. And these young people will be very glad to be doing this type of work. I've already indicated that uh, this lady, she's dressing the pork and serving it or selling it to shops. That's, you know, dressing the pork, uh, uh, packaging it and um, carrying it to the shops. All these are jobs that people can do. So when we talk about agri, we're not talking about everybody going to the farm. We're talking about the value addition that will come on the agri and absorb people into meaningful productivity. Another area that uh, we, we were thinking, uh, adding value to some of our raw products. For example, I've said that we will meet a gold coin called the Ya Asentua gold coin. And we'll encourage every Ghanaian to keep a, a piece of that gold coin. That means own your own gold. This piece of gold coin, when you have it in your pocket, first of all, we don't have any uh, 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 gold refineries here. I, have, I think we have one which is struggling. We will help it to establish well so that we can add value to our gold, our longest exporting material. Add value to it. Thank you. Dr. Papakos Indum, same question to you. The three topmost actions that you will take to create jobs. Dr. Edward Mahama in June this year promised that he was going to halve unemployment by um, half. He was going to half it in two years and he's told us how he's going to do that do you agree let me give you the three um, actions uh, and i want to do it from a practical experience because i have done it in this country and i want to use the same experiences in government number one is we must provide a market in ghana for what we produce right here number two is use the purchasing power of government uh, to, 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 to buy what is it that we produce, the services and goods that we create jobs. And number three, come up with a positive attitude towards entrepreneurship and success in, in, in the country. And let me give you the examples for all three of them. Number one, in terms of a market, we, we talk about the, the, the issue of whether it's rice or yam or anything else. Unless there is a market in Ghana for the rice, we are, you are not going to get anywhere producing anything. And I have done an example. You go to Rara in the Volta region today. We have gone there, refurbished a, a rice mill, and over 5,000 farmers now have hope. They are now going to expand their farms because the rice mill is there, it is working, and it will buy each and every paddy rice that they grow. And there are people ready, ready now to buy the rice. That's why I am confident that in four years we can eliminate, no, no need to import the $1.2 billion worth of, of rice that is coming. And in its wake, we will create more than 1 million real jobs. We have done the calculation. I've done the work through practical hands-on experience, and I know it is possible. And the same applies for producing yam chips, for producing fruit juices and so on and so forth. Num and and number, number two is using the purchasing power of the state. And I've tried this in the private sector where I mandated that none of our hotels should buy anything that is imported if we produce that thing in Ghana. So rice, like fruit juice. And because of that, our people come all over the, the country and find what is it that is produced in Ghana and use it. If we did the same thing in government that nobody funded with the state's money, should go and, and buy anything that is imported. Can you imagine the jobs that we will create in this country? It can be done, and I say it will be done because I've done it in the private sector, and I know it can be applied in the public sector as well. And number three, a positive attitude towards entrepreneurship. Uh, today, um, my group of companies, we are uh, the, the biggest employer in Comenda at Negua for Abrim. But ask me, which one of the DCEs whether it's ND, MPP, NDC, DCS has come to talk to me about my companies. None, none of them. So we will use a more positive attitude to entrepreneurship to encourage the people who are investing their money and more jobs will be created because we will be helping them get a market and using the state's purchasing power. It will be done. Mr. Jacob Osayabwa, 
the three priority steps that you would take to reduce and create em employment, reduce unemployment and create employment? Um, unemployment is created when the graduate, after completing school, cannot find himself or herself a job. And so there's a gap between our educational system and our industry. So as part of our strategies, what we're saying is that we're going to restructure the, most of the ministries, and we're going to merge the Ministry of Education and Industry, such that the curriculum will ensure that the approach of our education will feed into the industry, the industries that are existing in our country and the industries that are yet to be created uh, in the near future. By so doing, we'll reduce that. Again, we we're talking about the National Electronic Data Infrastructure. When we have it in place, just at the click of a button, we tend to know the, the professions of most of the unemployed and their various locations. And out of this, we'll be able to even realize that, no, there's an electrical job in Tema, while somebody is in the northern region uh, who is an electrical engineer and is not finding a job over there. Through this visibility, we can easily reconnect them and they're having job centers for all of this. Again, coming back to the fact that we have most of these unemployed, we have to reorient their profession out of school. Now, what we are stating is that we'll come out with an unemployment benefit because with this high level of graduates unemployed in our country, it's a national security threat. And we must find a means of making sure that we give them something. And what we are saying is that before we give you unemployment benefits, it will go for those who are above 25 years. And then before you can assess that, we have to reorient you to a particular form of profession. Because sometimes if you go to the university and learn Spanish, and after completing, you say that you are unemployed, there are no Spanish job in Ghana. And so we can reorient you within the, the, the agri sector. Even you can go and rear a uh, grass cutter, which can fetch you money. By so doing, it will help you to improve yourself once you try to um, educate yourself. One of the most important things that we're talking about that we can create a lot of jobs for these young ones is the ethnicity, our differences in our culture. What we are saying is that we're going to sit up with our chiefs and with, between the month of July up to the end of September, where most of the, uh, uh, um, the Western nations go on vacation, they can come to Ghana, experience our different cultures, right from voter to upper east. And we know the kind of level of employment from tourist guide, the transportation, the roads that will link up to all this, everything I want to talk about is about job creation for them. Thank you very much. Now, we will take a question which is supposed to be a follow-up to Dr. Papakosi Indum because it is more suited to the answers that you provided. And it's a question that is coming from Mr. Jojo Kwesin, the Accra Regional Manager of the AGI. Good evening to you all. Like you said, my name is Jojo Kwesin. My question is, manufacturing growth has declined and considering the fact that manufacturing is the pivot or fulcrum on which all economic activities gyrate around, what are you going to do to revive the manufacturing sector if you are giving the nod? Thank you. You can answer. One minute. When, when we talk about manufacturing growth declining, well, there are reasons. One clear reason the past four years has been doom so. And so you must fight, solve the energy problem. And the energy problem is going to be solved not through a technical solution, but a financial solution. Because what is overburdening the system is a huge debt that the government has put on the energy players, especially ECG and the like. So that's one thing, it's to solve the, not just the power generation, but the power distribution problem that we have in Ghana, and it will be done by concentrating on the financing part. But the second part, it has to do with encouraging our manufacturers, 
by using the state's purchasing power and the state's authority to give them a market in this country. If someone produces uh, some, some man, a, a drug in Ghana, why then allow the same drug to be imported? Thank you. Now, the follow-up question to Dr. Edward Mahama is this. I would like to know if you, by your promise in June to halve unemployment in two years, if you were elected president, would you care to share with Ghanaians what the enormity of the unemployment problem is? Well, first of all, thank you for getting Dr. Park within doing to endorse that it can be done. I hope you will now vote for me since you have gotten that, that answer. But the enormity of the uh, problem is this. It's been said at this table that um, we are churning out graduates from all the tertiary institutions. My figures are about 50,000, but only 5,000 get reasonable jobs. A reasonable job is a job where you are paying taxes yourself as an income tax, where you are paying social security. All other people are doing what we call informal work. By getting these young people to be doing the kind of work that they will do when you are processing or, for example, working in a rice mill or working in a, 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 a um, packaging uh, goods, you know, in a factory. All these are works that, uh, the jobs that young people can get, and they'll begin to pay income tax. They will begin to pay social security. And so basically, uh, my promise, uh, Park Wissi has endorsed that it can be done, and it will be done. Let's see if Mr. Jacob Oseyebwa agrees that his solution is workable within two years to halve unemployment. We have been averaging, unemployment has been averaging 8.82% in Ghana. The highest we have had has been, we have recorded, has been 12.90%. That was in 2005. Is the solution profit feasible? It's quite subjective uh, because each industry and then the, the, the lead time that you need to establish that. And so you cannot out of the blue and say that you're going to reduce that. But if it is it's, it's, it's in terms of the agribusinesses uh, whereby you want to grow cassava and then export them, then within six months you'll be able to fix that. But you ask yourself how many uh, of the unemployed that you can actually engage in that sector. So it's actually dependent on sector by sector. I'd wanted to react on the AGI, the manufacturing aspect. You know, much is actually dependent on the country-specific advantage of these industries. You cannot just set any industry in Ghana. And that is why I keep on saying that we need to set industries out of our natural resources because the cost of the product is actually dependent on the sources of input. And power is one. The, the source of the raw material is another. Sorry, but you have been bailed out. We will take a very final question, and it will be coming from uh, another private sector person, Dr. Eric Osei Esibe. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana. Dr. Eric Osei Esibe, if you're here, please, can we take your question? It's a major question. It goes for all of you. Gentlemen, please don't forget that you have the right to put your hand up to indicate if you want to uh, give a rebuttal. You can request a rebuttal. If someone is giving a solution, a suggestion to our economic problems, and you feel that that diagnosis is wrong and the prescriptions are not workable, you are at liberty to put your hand up and respond to them. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, good evening to our distinguished uh, candidates. Right. Um, my question is quite simple. Taxes in Ghana are generally seen to be high and detrimental to private businesses. Recently, ICU and Association of Ghana Industries actually increased or intensified calls 
on government to reduce the tax burden on the their concern is that the multiplicity of taxes are actually impacting negatively on workers and businesses in Ghana. However, the country's tax to GDP ratio is one of the lowest, averaging about 16%, which often leads government to record large budget deficits and borrow hugely to finance infrastructure. When you get a note, how are you going to ensure that the tax burden is reduced, debt stock is at sustainable level, without sacrificing infrastructure projects that are critical for our growth and development? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll start with Mr. Jacob Oseyebwa. Thank you. Um, every country needs taxes in order to develop. But the most important thing is as to how to optimize that taxation. Now, in Ghana, our major problem is the fact that we have only a few of us in the formal sectors who are being taxed. And that is why we have that high level of tax burden uh, on them, which is not actually helping. One of the means, just as I've indicated, is the uh, establishment of the National Electronic Data Infrastructure. I had a discussion with TUC um, last week, and I told them that it's, it's good for them to also expand their, their union to bring in the informal sector, because in most of the African countries, we have the three sectors of our economy. That is the formal sector, that is where we have the informal sector and the, the traditional sector. Now, if we are able to expand our tax bracket, to bring in the informal sector and the traditional sectors. That is where we have about 80% of the ordinary Ghanaian there. If you're able to expand that, then we'll be in a position to build upon that. Now we're talking about infrastructure. It's good, we need to develop that. If you are creating wealth from our own economy, we'll be able to do that. It's not about an issue of um, um, just, just, just um, establishing or creating infrastructure for its sake. In businesses, we have what we call return on assets. And so we need to really find out whether that infrastructure that the government wants to embark on, is it not politically motivated for you to build huge schools in certain places that we don't even have uh, uh, students to occupy them? It's not productive enough. Meanwhile, if we have used that same amount to have upgraded a technical school somewhere, it could have served the nation better, and, and for us, we can actually have uh, uh, the products coming out to serve all of us. And so what we need, yes, infrastructure we need, but we need to do analysis on the return of its access to the country before we embark on. If we did that, then as a nation, we'll have the key to our development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Papakwesi Indum. And gentlemen, let's have some very specifics to what exactly you intend to do. Corporate tax presently for industries is 25%. Is there an intention to do anything about it? For mining, is 35%. Is there an intention to do anything about it? Does it hurt or it does not? Well, I, I have um, had the occasion to say very clearly that what we are practicing is a lazy man's approach to taxation. And, and, and so what government does is energy. Everybody needs power. Everybody needs petrol. And so they pile on the taxes there because we can't live without them. Okay, that the, the few people who pay tax, so they squeeze us some more. And then people give up. And, and the, tax, the, the amount of tax goes down. So my point is that if we get away from the lazy man's approach to taxation, what we will then end up doing is to do the right kinds of things specifically. Uh, I have talked earlier on about the implementation of the national identification system, which comes with a unique numbering scheme, which then if you apply it, then it means you go and buy a house, you go and sell a house, you go and rent a house, you do all of those kinds of things. Well, it's recorded and we know you earn income. 
and therefore you pay tax and if we are able to do all of those things then I believe I believe that we can within four years reduce the level of taxation for those who are paying tax now by at least 50 percent in this country in this country because we would have expanded the numbers of people who are coming in would have increased productivity and therefore we would be able to 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 raise more money uh, by by applying applying the funds that come from uh, the people who are now producing and uh, you know we talk about infrastructure look infrastructure we are spending on infrastructure that is not related to productivity and that is one important matter we need to address and so when you go uh, to those areas for example in the western region where cocoa is being grown where gold is being produced where bauxite and, and all those kinds of things are being produced they have terrible horrible roads you go to sampa you go to Tiobodom, you go to the places in, in the Bronga Hafu where they are growing cashew and so on and so forth, the roads are terrible. So we, we need to, to increase the level of infrastructure that leads to productivity. That is what will help us, will help us eventually to reduce this, this tax burden that is there. And, and, and you know what, what happens in, in Ghana. Uh, when somebody sees you that you are being successful, the first thing that if they don't like you, they come to you is, are you paying tax? They don't ask you, uh, how can we help you to produce more? They, they come to, to punish you. And so we need to make sure that we change that attitude. And for me, by changing that attitude, more people will encourage to produce more, will collect more tax from more people, and therefore the rate will go down. Thank you. And Dr. Mahama, they, some of your competitors have been saying that, for example, the 17.5% VAT on domestic airline tickets in the country will be completely abolished. There are other taxes, and your colleagues have just indicated how to deal with the tax system. Everybody is singing, reducing tax. How will you do that, and at the same time, be able to garner sufficient revenue to improve the economy? Corruption is part of the problem. I will tell you this. In 1973, when I was a doctor in Nalergu, I champion tried to bring a national identification uh, system. They paid money to contractors, they chopped the money. Later, another government tried, they chopped the money. Between meals and Kufo, monies were chopped. So basically, until we, until we are able to, to have an identification system for people. I mentioned earlier real estate uh, taxes, for example. You can't collect them because there are no addresses, you know. And when people go and borrow money, they can easily change their abode. You can't trace them. So banks are, uh, you know, not uh, interested in, in lending money. We can do simple, simple things that will put the system in place. And this is what I mean by the new beginnings. Restructure the institutions, put systems in those institutions that work so that taxation will be easy because you can identify people. Taxation will be easy because there are addresses and you can actually go and you know, raise real estate ta taxes. So th the simple, simple things that we need to do to make the system work and functional and easy, we are not doing. Corruption at the ports, massive corruption there, you know, if we cut it, government will have the money. So basically, the infrastructure we need to build, we have the money to do it if we plug the loopholes through which individuals are siphoning government funds. And that is what I will do as president. I will fire any minister that is corrupt. Sometimes they just reposition them. We've seen it. If you are minister of sports and you have chopped some money, they take you to the presidency or something. That must stop. That must stop. We must crack the whip and crack it properly so that this is what I have been promising, that I'll be a leader who will abhor corruption. Abhor corruption. And then we will be able to get the money to do the infrastructure that we need. The other day I was traveling from Ketekrachi to Yendi, and I saw four or five trucks of loaded with yam, stranded, broken down. All the yam will be rotten because in this heat, when they stand there, the yam gets perished. 
And so the few yam that comes into Accra will be very expensive because you've lost mo most of it. So post-harvest losses is another area where a PNC administration will turn its attention to help Ghanaian farmers produce. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a brief break at this point. You have a rebuttal you want to give? Okay, Dr. Indum has a rebuttal. Let's hear you. Yes, I, um, we, we have talked about, and my colleagues have, have talked about national identification. But you see, what, what, you know, I believe they are refusing to, to state clearly is that there's a leadership problem here. There's a leadership problem here. What is so difficult to understand about the need for a national identification system, a database, and its implementation? What is so difficult that John Dramani Mahama, these eight years, has refused to implement, fund them, fund them. So they should, they should hit it right on the head. That is a leadership problem. There's a deliberate, deliberate in, a, attempt to, to solve this problem. More than two thirds of our people have been identified. The system is there. It's just about a third of the, of the, of the, of the problem that needs to be fixed. So let's, let's get it straight. We can get there. We can get there. All right. President. I'm Dr. getting this right. Mr. Sayeb also has a rebuttal. Please do it quick. It's, an, it's one minute. Yes. Um, with the National Electronic Data Infrastructure. In fact, I myself, I picked three ministers to Germany on that. And again, the NIA board also, and AMA. Now, the setup at NIA is not have proven to this government that the NIA setup lacks certain things that can actually help us to use it as a tool, as a, as a planning tool for our country. Now, we've had investors who are willing to do that because it's self-financing. And again, government, most governments are afraid of the visibility that the national electronic data infrastructure can give unto us as a nation. If you're able to do that, I think this country will move forward. Just at the click of a button, we'll have solutions to most of the problems that we have, our sanitation and everything. But it's up to the government to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will take a break here. And then when we return, we shall be dealing with one of the most critical aspects of the economy. And that will be the energy sector. And we shall have a rather short uh, period when we return. You shall also be speaking to uh, 